one once bitten here. So for this uh, philosophical ramblings, I'm actually also doing kind of a pain episode. I'm in the midst of a very long and tedious project, and I thought I might as well use the time to uh, produce some kind of content. I owe you at least one battle report from the tournament I went to last, and I actually have a couple more battle games with battle reports I could make, and I plan on making, and tomorrow I plan on playing a couple more games. So there's plenty of battle report uh, fodder uh, that I just I just need to to create them, and um, I think the only reason I haven't so far it's just it's not that I'm so busy that I couldn't take the hour that it takes to create a battle report. It's just sometimes I'm busy enough and there's other things I want to do that I just don't feel like it. And uh, if I force myself to do it, then it starts feeling like a job. So I just tell myself it's not a big deal. This stuff's there. You'll you'll do the battle report soon enough and um, even if it takes a little bit um, or and then there's and lately there have been there have been several games I haven't made reports just because enough time went by I was like screw it I'm not going to do it anyway so what I have wanted to do was get this darn castle finished I've been working on this for years well it's kind of like a dissertation you don't work on it for years you either do it or you don't do it and sometimes when you don't do it it, it takes years and years and years so for those of you who have followed the channel for a long time, I would say it was back in 2012, I think, uh, possibly 2013, that I started on this castle set. And basically, I bought this old Games Workshop castle with the, uh, the main gate, four turrets, and three sets of walls, or maybe five sets of walls, I'm not sure. A bunch, I think five sets of walls. I traded some old stuff for it um, back in 2011 when I lived somewhere else and then when I moved I still had it and I ran into a game store owner that I never go to a store anymore because it's not really set up for playing but uh, he's just amazing at doing uh, buildings and stuff he helped me design my uh, Empire of Sonstall and my Beast Herds display boards Anyway, and I saw he was painting some buildings, and just the way he did it was just amazing. It just looked so beautiful when he was done. And um, so he designed this for me, told me what to do, and I've been doing it. So what you do, and by the way, I'm done with the with the main gate, the four turrets, and two of the walls. And I just have three walls left. So what you do is you paint every brick a different color. I mean, it's not every brick a different color. You have five colors and you go around painting bricks, you try to do it to where um, the same color is not on any two consecutive bricks. And it just looks hokey. It looks, it looks absolutely awful. And uh, then when you're all done doing that, then you start dry brushing it, uh, different shades and intermingling some washes, and then you touch it up. And it, I think it just looks absolutely beautiful. And I've started using the main gate and... Um, a couple turrets for a uh, makeshift Kingdom of Equitaine display board. And although I think it'd be possible to make a better one, it's pretty easy. It's easy to store because it's not all assembled. You can take everything apart. Um, anyway, but it's bothered me that this one has been sitting around unfinished. It's like, you know, it's always nagging at me. And those kind of things always nag at me. Anything unfinished. It's kind of like my Undying Dynasties army right now. Like I, I jumped on there. I got 80 skeletons, mostly painted. Like I really just need to go back and just touch them up. And then I got sidetracked and haven't touched them in a while. And it's just it's like a burr a burr under my saddle. With them just sitting there. Unfinished. So. I really have a couple topics I thought I might talk about, and this just came to me. I haven't scripted this out. I don't have an outline, and this probably be somewhat disjointed. Uh, but the first topic I thought I might just think out loud about is why do I do stupid shit like this? And um, when I say stupid stuff, I mean there's I could have painted this castle, and the whole castle, in just an hour or two by priming it some dark color dry brushing it. And in fact, I, I had at one point with something very similar. And the and the, the difference between that and this is time-wise is just astounding. Like this is, I don't know how much, I mean, 30 times, 50 times more time consuming. 
doing it this way. And um, I think my willingness just to start a project like this, as I did in 2012, and start painting this first single brick, <laughs> knowing that it's, it's going to take it's a lot of single bricks um, to get the whole thing done. I think that's probably one of the biggest ways I've changed as I've gotten at least a little bit older, squarely in middle age now, is, um, you know, when I was 27 years old, I, I quit a job, a very a pretty good job, uh, to start my own company, which is funny because at the time I was at 27, I felt, oh, I'm so old, I've wasted my life, I should have done this years ago, and now I look back, I'm like, dang, man, you're 27 years old, that's so young. But one of the problems I had at the, when in running that business was that I wanted everything right now. Um, I can look back at it in hindsight and say, you know, we had a good little business. I mean, I owned it for 10 years before selling it. It was um, it provided for us and the family. It was always growing steadily. The biggest problem we ever had was cash flow due to growth because we were we consistently grew over over the decade and. Um, I could never appreciate it at the time. I could never enjoy it. As always, I'm a failure because I should have started this and within a year. We should have been, you know, hugely successful. And I think as a lot of things were like that, um, you know, I would start working out, for instance, and then I'd do it for two or three months and I'd expect miraculous results. And if you've ever seen me, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a skinny guy, I guess. And, um, you know, I've never, even when I was a, kid and I worked out all the time. I was never a big guy. It's just not in my DNA. And uh, I just always wanted results immediately. So anyway, one of the ways I think I've changed the most is now I think I, I see things differently and I'm very, I only do things where I don't mind the process too much, even though it's not ideal. And um, I'm willing to commit myself, commit myself to just doing it doing it and forever and I think this uh, whole castles is not the main example of that in my life I think it's a pretty good metaphor for that in my life so I think the short answer is why do I do stuff like this is the whole time I'm thinking you know what when this is done I'm gonna be really happy with it and so therefore all the time it takes to get it done doesn't really matter. I'd rather be happy with it with a million hours invested. And um, then I just jump into it and the process is what it's all about. It's not about holding your breath, being miserable, waiting, just hoping it gets done as quickly as possible. It's, um, it's just, now it's just something I do. I, you know, I just work on it and it takes as long as it takes. And I'm, I think, increasingly comfortable with that, much more so than I used to be. Don't know why that is. Don't know what clicked uh, to make that the case. Which is also, by the way, what makes it very frustrating for me, because I feel that as a miniatures painter, I'm still not nearly as good as I want to be. And I, I, will, I will admit that I think I'm, I'm a pretty good miniatures painter. I'm not, I'm not fishing for compliments here, and I'm not being falsely... Um, What's the term? Uh, falsely humble. There's no false humility here. Um, I think I'm good, but I'm, I'm certainly not great. And there's, I have habits and ways of painting that just frustrate me because I know they don't work. They don't. They don't. They, they work for one level, but they don't um, work for the way I want to be. And um, so I find that when I'm painting an army or painting a miniature, I'm willing to spend the time on it. I'll spend as much time as it needs, but the problem is I don't have a clear vision of how more time spent on it is going to matter, how it's going to affect anything. So then I get frustrated, like, well, then what the hell does it matter? I can spend one hour or 20 hours in this. It's going to look basically the same. And that's just frustrating because I genuinely am willing to spend forever on it, and I just don't know how. I've been lately trying to experiment with new techniques, and they didn't turn out all that great. But... Maybe there's hope, because at least I'm doing that. Maybe there's hope that I'll, with some continued practice, 
uh, using those techniques, they will get to a point where I'm happy with the result. So, anyway. And by the way, you probably notice I'm in a different room than normal. My son went to college. I have three kids. Two are now in college. I have one who has just a couple years left in high school. And it's really weirded me out, by the way, for my kids growing and leaving the home. And uh, his room is set up such that it, it made for a easy conversion to a painting. I can steal a corner of it for painting, and then when he comes home, periodically I can clean my stuff up, and it's I don't think it really invades his room too much. So it's been kind of nice. So normally I paint on our dining room table. And I like that because I like being with the family. They can be watching TV or doing homework or doing whatever they're doing, and I'm still kind of there. Whereas now I'm kind of tucked away up in a room. Um, I don't like that. But I do like that my stuff is out. Um, you know, it's kind of all here. I don't have to go searching for it. I don't have to invade the the kitchen, the dining room table, I'd evade it and I would just leave my stuff. Once I got it all out, I'd leave it out for like three weeks. And my wife's always been so great about that. She doesn't say a thing. She likes, you know, she was happy for me to have my hobby. Um, but then my whole dining room was wrecked for weeks at a time. Um, yeah, so there's one thing I was thinking about. Um, yeah, I don't want to give examples about other things, you know, if I said the castle's a metaphor, there's other things I do that it just sounds like I'm just, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging about um, different things. But anyway, I find that an intriguing thing to think about just because I, I never used to be this way at all. I was always very short-term oriented. So the thing I want to talk about, because um, I think I need to change my mind about something. I think, maybe, I don't know. Um... So I thought I would think out loud, and then you're obviously welcome to chime in with your feedback. But I remember when I first started playing the hobby, back when this channel was named 84321605, I think that's what it was. It's still out there and exists. I never check it. I never, <laughs> ever, ever. Um, but that's that's what this channel started as, and then I created a new one. I actually lost access to that at one point, and so I created once bitten 360, and then I just liked the name better than... Eight four three two sixteen oh five. Um, but when I first started playing, I mean, I thought I was a, a decent player, but I was playing in a group that, in, in hindsight, was just not very competitive. Um, a bunch of guys playing at a local hobby. I mean, not even a bunch. There's maybe, you know, eight of us, and. Uh, we didn't really go to tournaments. I think, you know, we would host tournaments every now and then, but it'd be like an eight-person tournament. And, you know, I would do pretty well at tournaments and therefore think that I was a pretty good player. And um, I made the effort to start integrating our gaming club with other gaming clubs around this, the region. So we started purposely holding events and then eventually tournaments just to get us playing each other. I just wanted... It just seemed kind of a cool idea to, to uh, connect with other players. Now... Again, now it's weird. Now we have such an active tournament scene that I take it for granted that I play people from all, all over the country. Uh, back then, it was just a few people. But when we first started doing that, um, we started playing the club. That at the time, I was I was uh, two and a half hours away from here, and we played the club that actually is located here where I live now. And these guys were very tournament-focused. They very much were netlisters. Uh, in all the the best and worst, you know, implications of that, and they would come down and just rock our world as a club. I mean, I actually did okay against them, but uh, most for the most part, their club just slaughtered our club in in the tournaments. And I think I don't know. I don't want to say that I looked down my nose at the list they brought. I don't know if that's accurate, but it, I think at some level there's a certain a certain level of resentment there um, because people before you know my game club we were just bringing lists that I mean if we're being honest I think people still brought lists they thought were competitive they just weren't serious enough about it to go on the forums and really research stuff and pull a net list or you know get with other people and collaborate on what are ways to really break the break the the rule set um, but in hindsight, I don't think that was fair. I'm like, you know, 
just because you're playing with a group that that whether they think they're competitive or not are not competitive uh, don't hold it against another group that that plays uh, very very competitively so I thought I had overcome that and now I'm you know for the last several years I play in what I think is a fairly competitive tournament scene and um, you know I, I bring lists that are you know it, I take lists that I that I think I could win with and um, the only reason I don't go on the internet and grab a list and play with it is because just because there's a powerful list on the net doesn't mean it's going to work for me. I I'm, I, uh, I think a certain way about it, and uh, I need a certain list. Um, but it, it's been happening. So then, especially towards the end of Warhammer Fantasy 8th Edition, and especially, I don't know if you, if you watch the channel, if you remember me and another buddy, we're, we were trying to go through the end time scenarios and I don't know how many we did, but it was just, you know, after a while, it's like, you know, the scenarios were designed such that the uh, the bad guys were supposed to win, you know. And it was a, it was a narrative game enough, but it just, you know, it wasn't really competitive. It's like, it's it'd be really, really difficult for for anybody but the bad guys to win. Um, but then, you know, the end times and different um, units that were created... A, and uh, introduced, and then the the lore of undeath, and they're just just the the possibilities change in so drastically in such a short period of time that we I had that same feeling again where I feel there are people that really studied it, that really knew that, and they were showing up with just really really rock hard lists, and um, I find that sometimes people can bring a rock hard list, and it doesn't bother me in the slightest. And sometimes people can bring a tough list and it really discourages me. Like, I don't want to play it. And so I've been thinking a lot lately about why is that? What is it about a list that um, that I expect to see? And I'm trying to become explicit about that because it's not fair to anybody for me to have these implicit expectations of how other people play the game. And... I know that the lists that I used to hate playing against were what I call the Uber Death Stars, where somebody just threw all their points in one unit, and they're especially if you're playing rules as written, so you didn't get any points for the for killing a unit unless you killed every last wound. <laughs> uh, so a slight tangent. So I was at Buckeye Battles a year ago. I won't say the guy's name. A great, good, good, very good Midwest player. He had a Dark Elf army. If you remember this game, but at the end of the game. I was playing Empire, and uh, I just killed everything of his on the table. Uh, not through any brilliant tactical play. I pretty much just shot him off, which shows my hypocrisy. But So he had a like a elf lord on a dragon that uh, I killed. I shot the dragon out from under him and, and w wounded the lord, I think, through combat, but got him down. He only had one wound left. He was clinging on to dear life with one wound left. He had a huge horde of witch elves with a BSB on the, I think, the cauldron. I killed the cauldron from under the BSB, wounded the BSB, but the BSB is alive with one who left, killed every one of those stupid witch elves, every one of them. There's like 40 of them in there, except one. And pretty much everything of his, I thought I'd killed. Anyway, he ended up winning the game because I didn't get any points off of him. I was so frustrated. <laughs> okay, back on topic. So I find that some lists, I'm not saying his list was this, some lists I don't like, it was the Uber Death Star. It's like, I'm going to put all my points in one unit, and no matter what I do, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, for you to get those points. So, good luck. And I'm like, well, that just kind of sucks. I mean, you don't really even have to play the game at that point. You just kind of show up, you put your you put your unit down there, and you say, there you go, ha ha. And I think... Uh, I felt the same way back in 7th edition towards the end when the Demon Book came out. And in 7th edition, you used to get magic dice uh, based on... Uh, I'm blanking out. Was it based on your, your magic level? But then there's ways to get more dice. And it was possible to d to build a demon's list and get 24 power dice. And, you're, you know, I might have, like, four. And you would have 24. Something it was ridiculous. If you If you really abused the rules, you could figure out a way to do that. Because, like, pink horrors could generate dice and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, what's the point of this? I mean, you're just going to show up, and it's just going to be you casting spells. I mean, obviously, I can't stop them. 
um, it's it's a flaw in the rules, and um, it's just you playing the game. Uh, one of my least enjoyable games ever was against um, a dark elf avoidance list, and th actually I could have enjoyed that one because it because it was the first time I played an avoidance list, but it ended up being just awful because I wasn't playing the game. It was my opponent was just moving around. I couldn't charge anything. I couldn't see anything. It was just very frustrating. And then lately I complained about a list because it was so high shooting that, again, my opponent, I felt, didn't have to play the game. He just had to sit there and roll dice to shoot. So I'm thinking, you know, if this were real life and somehow I, you know, it was, I was the general and my job was to save the lives of my army and, you know, whatever objectives I had. Yeah, man, I would, I'd take, I'd take whatever I could if I could just shoot at them and and uh, kill the enemy before they came close, of course I would do that. I think I'd owe it to my people to do that. But in a game like this, where it's not life and death, I'm like, you know, the reason we come together is to play this game. And if you bring a list that is designed so that I can't play the game, really, or you don't have to play the game, then why, why are we here? So the Ninth Age, one thing I really like about it is the... Uh, the rules team is cognizant of that, and although they may not talk about it the same way I talk about it, they say similar things. And so you really, as far as I can tell, you can't bring too much of a Death Star. Of course, I say that, and somebody's going to figure out how to do it. And you really can't dominate the magic phase. They really, I think somebody in the rules team must have got their butt handed to them because of magic and decided they never wanted that to happen again. But as far as I can tell, you really can't bring a list that dominates the magic phase such that it's going to win the game for you. I think you can still build some pretty abusive shooty lists, and I think, from my understanding for what's in the works, that's going to not be possible pretty soon. And I appreciate that, because what I, what I want is I want to have to beat my opponent, and I want my opponent to have to beat me. And I appreciate that a lot of times list building is, well, every time, all the time, list building is a very important part of that strategy. Your strategy starts with your list. And it goes right through the deployment. And sometimes by the time you get to turn one, the a game may already kind of be won or lost just because somebody has put more thought into their army, how it works, how it's going to win, how they need to deploy it, etc. But nevertheless, I'm okay with that. I just want you to have to play. I want, I want movement to matter. I want choices to matter. Um, and I want both of us to be involved in that game. So I guess one thing I'm wondering about is, am I just being the same way I used to be, but I'm just phrasing it differently now? Am I just mad because people are bringing lists that are more competitive than what I'm playing against on a weekly basis? And the way I respond to that is complaining that they're bringing lists that aren't fun. Or is that a justifiable expectation that the lists you bring... Um, you know, allow for both people to play the game. So, I don't know. I think, I mean, right now, I think that that it's the latter, that I think it's a fair expectation, but I don't think it's incumbent on the player. I think if a list is possible, then it's not really fair to accuse some, to say that you shouldn't do what's legal to do because it's uncool. I, I don't... Because then, yeah, where do you, that's a slippery slope. Where do you draw the line with that? Then I bring a list. Like, at the last tournament, I took an, an all-night list because I hadn't played Kingdom of Ectrain for a while, and I thought it'd be fun just to pull out all my knights. Um, but if somebody shows up and they're like, well, you know, that's really skewed. That's not fun for me. You know, how do you argue against that? So I don't think you can really blame players. And I think when I've you know, to the extent that I've accused players. But to, but if I've accused players of, of doing something wrong because they bring lists that aren't fun, I don't think that's fair. I think it's incumbent on the designers of the game to make sure that that can't happen. That that um, just by the parameters in the game, the parameters around list building, and etc., that um, both players will always have to bring a list that doesn't play itself. They have to play it. So... Anyway, those are my thoughts on this philosophical ramblings. Curious if um, you agree, disagree, or more importantly, are there things that I'm not considering in it?